All right, we're live. Hello, hello. Hello. So, Alina, thank you so much for welcoming us in. Uh, I made the journey over to London uh, from the East Coast of the U.S. I'm thrilled to be here with you, Albert. Yeah, it's great to have you in my office. Yeah, this is fantastic. Uh, so, I, I think if we listen to Alina's uh, descriptions uh, of us, and, and thank you for the kind introductions, but neither one of us represent a single organization. So, we're, we're both freelancers in our own way. So, why don't we kind of start by just sharing a little bit about Underpin, the Association of the Future of Work. To tell, the, tell the world what it is that you do and why freelancing is so important to you. Yeah, so I mean, very brief backstory to this. I actually grew up as a ballet dancer. I went to the Royal Ballet School. So I, I grew up very embroiled in creativity, inevitably more freelance focused, and then totally changed my track and started philosophy of science and fell in love with computer science and started building things, started problem solving and doing business strategy consultancy. But the, the preface to, to really getting involved in, in the freelance world and flexible work world was, I ran a media and arts company, which helped young and emerging artists build businesses, which is why I love to surround myself with so much art, as well as doing business strategy consultancy to help businesses move into the high growth sector, which was usually about building highly skilled freelance teams to help them get over that hurdle. Okay. And being in this space and seeing kind of opposite ends of the spectrum, highly creative people through to like very technical businesses, all using flexible working and flexible work formats and project-based work, I started to get a really good grasp of why it wasn't working, even though so many people were trying to engage with it. And I, I boiled it down to four really key problems that I saw. One was a real lack of education, that people didn't really, it, people didn't learn how to commercialize their skills when they were employed or at university or at school, uh, let alone build a business around their skills. And so people were really struggling to, to build their independent careers, even though they were desperately trying to. Second was that there was a lack of kind of horizontal infrastructure to manage a whole business building in one place, rather than using lots of different bits of software and lots of different um, um, different products. Finally, was just access to community, other people and, and building networks and finding clients. You kind of feel a bit lost. We did this massive piece of research when we started and what we found was um, the only uniquely, um, the uniquely identifying characteristic of a successful freelancer was their network. So even the most, the most brilliantly skillful freelancers at, at, at the beginning of their journey were struggling to build a network around what they were doing. And so Underpin was all about facilitating, facilitating solutions to those problems in a single platform. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, I don't just do Underpin. The reason for that is Underpin is very focused on helping individuals build successful businesses. The more you look at the freelance economy, the more you realize that freelancers are early adopters of future of work systems. And, and that's, I think, why we started talking, which yep. was, you know, the CTW and, and what I do, the Association for the Future of Work, which is an organization similar to the CTW and its aim to help bring people together, brilliant minds to build better systems around the future of work, was all about going, well, there are interesting tracks and trends within this sector, but ultimately, we need to start having a broader conversation about how are working styles changing and how can we facilitate reducing barriers to entry to the system work and ultimately increasing the value that's created. I stopped talking now. That was that was a lot. No, that's there. a wonderful introduction. I love it. And and what you're hitting on is the piece that's been so engaging for me as I've stepped into it. So in the bio, if if you looked at it, I came out of the corporate world. So I, I worked for Kelly. Um, who founded the temporary staffing industry some 70 plus years ago. I worked for them for 27 years inside a corporate environment, but helping customers understand how they could engage a diversified workforce. And as that continued on, it also then became about disrupting our own organization, recognizing, wait a minute, the workers, the individuals are telling us, I want something different. And so as I left that organization, it was about getting into this market of fixing the way people connect with work. I just, I fundamentally have felt that it's broken for a really long time mm. and it's not small incremental change. There's a need for transformational change and that's where the Center for the Transformation of Work came about. It's about changing uh, work for a billion people by 2025. That's a big aspirational a goal. Aspiration. You know, uh, so the, the, the BHAG in there, and we've got to work our way through that, but it means we need to get to the individuals. I also tied into the introduction, you may have heard a reference to uh, the World Employment Confederation. So a group that's focused on public policy and advocating for healthy labor environments. So we think of, we're here in the UK, IR35, 
is it going to stay? Is it going to go? Where are we with that? You've got regulation happening all over the world. And so who's out there actively advocating to ensure that people can work the way they want to work? And my sense has always been that we need more people's voices in that. And unfortunately, we have a, a very decentralized working environment with the freelance community mm. who really struggles to get their voice heard. Well, I think there's there's no natural aggregators for individuals because they are, by virtue of the way they're working, not working through an aggregating uh, system. And I think that's it. It's a real problem in a number of ways. But I think one of the things that's really interesting about what you've just identified is there are companies who are looking at this problem. IR35 is a great example. There are businesses who are looking at how to solve compliance issues and, and building better talent systems. But for individuals, there need to be systems and tracks for their voices to be heard and for systems to be built with them in mind as well. 100%. So let's talk about some of these trends that are going on inside the marketplace. So learn, learn. We, we're, we've heard all about the great resignation. Individuals are opting out of their environment. They're quiet quitting. Um, so the worker has declared, this isn't right for me. I've always felt a big part of that is the lack of upskilling. Right. You know, that organizations are not investing in the learning and development. The freelancer has to do that on their own. Right. So if I'm starting my career as a freelancer or I want to, how do I figure out the right tracks? Well, this is this is a really interesting. So, so at Underpin, we have a, an accelerator program called the Underpin Freelance Business Accelerator. We now provide it to 179,000 undergraduates through the um, the higher education system in the UK. Um, we're starting to expand that. But what we really focus on is not teaching people specific skills, because ultimately, anyone who's gone through education, anyone who's watched enough Netflix has some expert skills and knowledge. <laughs> right? We live in a world that's so rich of information. There's so much stuff going on that actually generating knowledge is not the problem. Right. The problem is generating the frameworks to learn. And I have this very strong ethos of um, fail fast. The best way to be successful is to fail as many times as quickly as humanly possible in order to find out what does work. Because mm -hmm. you find out more from failing than you do from being successful. No question. And so what we, what we focus our educational program on and, and what's been so successful about it is it doesn't tell you what to do. It gives you a framework to work out what to do. And I think this is what's really missing. And earlier, I mentioned this piece of research we did that established um, the different types of freelancers and, and what identifies a successful freelancer or, or the, the demarcatable qualities of a successful freelancer. Um, now, what we found was there are three types. There is the just getting started, who yep. are usually fairly clueless. And they're doing this, this question of like, OK, I have a skill. I know it's valuable, but I'm not really sure why or where yet. And then we have what we call the fumble years which is the first three to five years of freelancing where you, you fumble around, you're bruised, you're bruised and, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly, you're scratched all over. And maybe you make that the other end, or maybe you give up because you're, you're nervous or things aren't going well or financial issues or whatever else. And then you have this successful group. And the successful group, by and large, are not better at their inherent skill than the first group. The thing that really is the big difference is their ability to access a network. Now, at its core, what makes for a successful freelancer? It's not being a skilled professional, it's being a successful problem solver. And the first thing we teach people in this framework is stop thinking about yourself as a professional with a skill. That's the old school of thought. Think about yourself as a, a business that solves problems and your skill set becomes this toolkit to start doing that. So I won't go into all the details of what happens throughout the whole Accelerate program. But at its core, I think what you're, what you're asking is, you know, how do we help people prepare to even begin this journey? Well, the first thing is to start to think about the commercial context within which you operate and how can we facilitate or, or rather give people the frameworks to start filling in the blanks themselves. It's so interesting you take it down that pathway because if I flip it and go inside the corporate organization, that's the same challenge that they're facing. It's a mindset challenge right. in most organizations to say, okay, how do I engage a broader workforce? Again, we've seen so many organizations who are struggling. I can't get the work done the right way. We keep hearing there aren't enough people to get work done. Right. I call bollocks on that Yeah. every single time because there is enough talent in this world. The question is, are you willing to engage people in a different way? Are you willing to take the time to define your problem, to figure out what it is that we really need to get done differently, how to approach it, and then to go out and search where there's an abundance of talent in the marketplace, right. the digital technology that's out there today that enables us to connect with capabilities and diverse thoughts and minds all over the world is absolutely incredible. But it's those organizations who go through those same stages. Mm. How do I figure it out? How do I fumble my way? How do I become good at this? We, we were talking about this earlier about the value of uh, diversity of thoughts. And 
the value that is brought to a company by having somebody who's worked on other projects who, who brings a new perspective is massive. But as you also really correctly identify, and I think it is the same on both sides, nobody's ever had to do it before, let alone at this scale. Mm -hmm. And so trying to identify these problems um, is very difficult for a lot of these companies and individuals. What I think is really interesting, and, I, and this is what I mentioned earlier about it being not just about freelancing as early adopters, but rather about the way that work is changing, is that you know, really successful companies in a way that, or companies that hire really successfully don't hire for positions. They hire for objectives and problems that they need to solve and they find skill gaps and then they fill those skill gaps. And it's exactly the same with project-based work, but on a smaller scale. And so we're starting to see people um, get involved in this, but I'd be interested to know from your perspective, really looking at, at, at what companies are doing, what creates successful decision-making processes for companies? So, fun question. <laughs> I'm gonna start by just challenging words. Okay. Hire. It's an old language. Yeah. Um, it implies an employee-employer relationship, a subservient relationship. Just go back to, to some of the basics inside corporations. Talent acquisition. Do you really want to be acquired? <laughs> and then retention, talent retention, name of a, departments inside organizations. I'm going to retain, so I'm going to buy you and then retain you. Yeah. Harkens kind of back to slavery, candidly. I, I just... I think one, organizations have to begin by rethinking the words that they use. Words matter. We need to get to a lexicon of, of where we're engaging talent to get things done, where we're able to figure out what, what is it that we want to accomplish as an organization and what's the best way of going about doing that. And I think for businesses, it's as, as they start envisioning a different way of accomplishing things, it changes. And I think, you know, it's, Big business, Google, was the one who really got branded um, when they announced 53% of their workforce was non-employees. Mm. And it caused everyone to say, whoa, 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 that's <laughs> a little bit different. And coming out of the temporary staffing industry, that kind of became a benchmark of looking at things and, and saying, so, okay, so how does work get accomplished? And boy, if my HR department only oversees the relationship with 47% of our workforce, well, that's a problem. Fast forward to today, it was Deloitte and MIT just published a, a paper on workforce ecosystems. Wonderful paper. Happy to send out a link to anyone if there are questions. But when they published it out, the opening um, in, in the forward is a piece from Unilever. 150,000 full-time employees across the world. So nice FMCG organization. We all know their brands along the way. Three million people in their extended workforce. Three million. When it's so 95% of the people that allow Unilever to be the organization that they are, are non-employees. So it begins with the mindset of letting go of the idea that I own and control some right. workforce. Well, interestingly, another part of our accelerates program and something that we work on quite a lot is this idea that as a freelancer, as an independent worker, you're a micro business. In fact, one of, one of, the, one of the core things that was part of our, our pitch when we started Underpin was saying, you know, don't look at this as a temporary this group of temporary staff. Look at this as an army of hyper efficient micro businesses that have almost no overheads, are incredibly easy to drop in and out of, of, of institutions, can work incredibly hard, be incredibly diverse, be incredibly engaged. And so actually you start to think about them as businesses, but then you bring up this other problem, which you, you, you articulated, which is, but the HR departments, the systems set up within businesses go, well, we look after this group and make sure that A, they don't sue us at any point, and B, we're kind of compliant to what we're supposed to be doing. But we're not looking at that group because they're not relevant to us. And on, on the one hand, we want them to function more like businesses, or perhaps rather better to say, they are better off functioning like a small business in the way they interact. And your point about the acquisition and retention of talent, if you think about it as rather the negotiation of a project with another work with another with another business is a much more interesting way of looking at it. And we mentioned before this talk started that you hire a freelancer, they're much more likely to challenge your project and, Absolutely. and improve it because they're bringing a new perspective and they don't want to work on something that's not going to look good on their portfolio or not, not look good on their work history. They have they to opt to be, in. They want, yeah, they have to choose this is something I want to work with, whereas an employee doesn't need to do that. The point that I was trying to get to, which I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, is on the one hand, they are better off performing like businesses and functioning like businesses in the way that they operate. But on the other hand, there is a responsibility that we need to look at of how we create standards and support and benefit systems for 
a lot of these not necessarily massively high earning uh, individuals who are still moving from business to business, but without the same welfare support as as full time employees. Yeah, the standards part is is a big piece, and that's so we we reference the Center for the Transformation of Work in the beginning um, as Open Assembly kind of started building out an environment addressing. Um, the way that organizations and businesses engage freelancers and start understanding the different mindset that you need to have and building a playbook for it, um, doing some amazing things with NASA. One of the challenges I had just out of my history in corporate was the need for standards, uh, mm -hmm. the needs for common language, because from a buying perspective, if everyone comes to me saying the same thing, but they're using different words, right. I kind of pull back. Um, the lack of standards causes question. It causes fear for a lot of people because I don't know what's going to happen. So that's one of the big e efforts that we're underway on in, in trying to look at what are those standards that we can put together as an industry, you know, whether it comes to the the, the way that you're classified as a worker, right. which gets to taxation. Yeah. Uh, let's just be call it what it is. It's making sure that the government's able to collect the taxes properly. And I have no problem on that, but making sure we're there. But then it's how you treat the worker, yeah. how you engage with the customer that's there. And then um, digital ethics right. is the other, which I think is a wide open area. And, and there's legal and regulatory aspects that we need to be aware of. That's yeah. very black and white. Um, every country has a very clean way of how they're doing things. Some clean, some maybe a little bit messy <laughs> as, we're, as we're living here in the UK this week. Uh, but then there's also what's good practice. Yeah. And I think the good practice side of things is where we need this community. We need the freelancers to speak up and have their voice heard about yeah. what do they expect. And, and, and I think, sorry, sorry to interject, but I think one of the things that's often overlooked is the importance on the ability to access talent by engaging with these issues. You know, when you talk to businesses about uh, compliance and, and practice and support and standardization, they hear admin, but actually what they're getting the opportunity to be involved in is, well, actually, do you want to have access to the best the best minds and the best work in the world? Well, you need to be setting up these systems because more and more people are starting to. It's, it's about streamlining it. You know, right. if I look at, at corporate organizations for the last 15 to 20 years, they have been standardizing and centralizing functions. So you mm -hmm. look at any business that has a global business services function or a shared services function, bring it together. And there's two main reasons. One, I mitigate risk. If I'm doing things the same way every time, we're less likely to do it in a way that's non-compliant. We don't want to end up in the newspaper for the wrong reasons. Yeah, I get it. The other is that I get value for money. If I buy the same thing a thousand times, I'm going to get a better price point than if I buy one thing a thousand different times. I, no question on those. But for many organizations, the pendulum's just swung too far to a process that's so standardized mm. that it doesn't apply to the way something else is done. If I need a logo design, do I really need to do a background check on the person who's right. designing a logo for me? Or do I just need a logo that inspires people who look at it? I also think going back to the point of standardization um, in terms of the infrastructure of how we communicate between between organizations, there is this there is this problem of of, of fear that you rightly described. You know, if there is a non-standard system, you have to apply a standard to it to feel comfortable. And what's happened is large enterprises who have a significantly higher level or uh, uh, they want a smaller risk profile because they want their compliance to be sorted with every interaction have to force this infrastructure onto these systems because they don't have an alternative. And one of the things that we've been looking at, um, which is kind of the, the beginning end of what you're talking about, is also standardizing the interaction around pitching. Like, what are the right formats for pitching? If I'm pitching for a logo, what are the key points the business should see? How can I make them feel comfortable with this interaction? And as we start to develop these standards around the interaction, will hopefully move the onus away from the from the enterprise who, who currently thinks they have to put their infrastructure on everything. And the, the hope is, well, actually, I said this to you earlier as well, small businesses are actually often creating best practice in this area because they have the flexibility and agility to deal with the freelancing individuals, how, how they feel most comfortable. And I think that's what you're seeing large business starting to adopt right now. Right. Is they're saying, wait a minute, small business has been figuring this out. Everyone's got multiple roles. When, right. you're, when you're launching a new business, you know, I, I, I'm the CEO and then I'm the janitor in, the, yeah. you know, 15 minutes apart. No problem on that. And everyone's comfortable with it. But in big business, we get very comfortable, stay in your lane, do yeah. these things. And the gaps between um, create problems. And then the overlaps 
create problems. And there be, there's this level of anxiety that develops inside organizations. And, and so kind of getting our way through that becomes really important. I, I want to move on to some other trends because there was talk of the metaverse earlier. Right. So Web3 tools, blockchain, metaverse. So where do you see all this fitting into the role of freelancing? So I, I'm an absolute tech nerd and spend a lot of my Love time it. and spend a lot of my time in this space purely in hypothetical world of this is what we could do in this, how exciting it is. I think there is a danger to try and force adoption of modern technology to solve simple problems. Mm -hmm. And that is not to say I'm not excited about Web3 and blockchain and they have a massive place in this world, which I'll talk about in a second. But I think that actually, uh, if we place too much technical understanding on solving these problems, we actually scare a lot of people off. And having a simplified standardized contract even if it is made on word and signed with a pen, you know, is better than not having it. And so mm -hmm. I think it's all about making these things accessible. So taking that as a first point, I think it's really important that a lot of these problems can be solved. Offline is maybe not the right word, nothing is offline, but, but in quite simple, practical, linguistic ways about simplifying terms and then making sure people understand. With that said, there are massive cool opportunities around decentralized workforces using Web3 and blockchain technology to track contracts, work history, uh, referencing, to make sure that uh, milestones are tracked effectively. I mean, within organizations, everybody will have experienced this in some way. You speak to a project manager and the accounts department and a product lead and, and a junior person, and none of them have talked to each other. And then you want your invoice paid and the accounts manager has to get information from all of these people to get it signed off. And having kind of clear, um, digitized, blockchain-based smart contracts that track your progress and have milestones attached to them, it will revolutionize the way that we interact and simplify it. Over COVID, what we've seen is a mass adoption of communication technology that has never happened before. My favorite example of this is Microsoft Teams, which is not my favorite piece of software, <laughs> but it's what most big enterprises are based on yep. old school Microsoft. So suddenly Microsoft went from, you know, Slack, I think is 20 million users. Microsoft Teams now has 120 million users using it actively daily. So this massive, massive adoption of communication technology that hadn't been done previously. Now this offers an opportunity and also, and also a problem. The opportunity is I now talk to a freelancer on the other side of the world in exactly the way, same way I talked to my full-time employee of 10 years. Yep. So I can now create systems that make it much easier for them to engage. It also creates the problem of how do I communicate effectively and making sure that things are not less lost in this transformation. So to back to your original question, the introduction of modern technologies like blockchain and Web3 will allow us to codify and create those standardized structures of communication, which allow us to have safety to hopefully allow us open up communication in a more relaxed way. Yeah, safety and trust. And it's the human part of things. Um, so I, I look at, you know, a lot of the research I've done is trying to tie things back to our behavior as consumers. Right. And simple reality is, is we've all got one of these yeah. and we've all transacted with it. it. We've accepted digital wallets as a way to conduct commerce. I think it was $80 billion transacted back in 2021 was the, the number that I saw. Okay. So what do I want around my career mm. that can be in my digital wallet? Right. That is shareable. How do I get agency over my own information? If if I go to work for an organization and and, and I've performed work for them and, and they said it was great work, shouldn't I be able to share that with someone else? Mm -hmm. Or if they had to do a background screen for me to come in and do that project for them and that's done, is that my property or is it their property? And, and so this idea of providing individuals agency over their own information right. and standardizing the data standards that allow that information to be owned and controlled by the individual and shared by the individual is one yeah. of those areas that I think is, is huge when it comes to blockchain. And you mentioned earlier standardization of language and terms, and that has to be where it starts. If we can create a similar lexicon that's used globally around talent and work and, and interactions and contracts, you create the ability to have these simple systems for recording and owning identity within the work world. And the more ownership you can give to people and the more standardization and infrastructure you can put around it, the easier it is then to have conversations between these institutions and individuals as they work. Yeah, and I, 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 this might stretch people a little too far, so I apologize if we go there. <laughs> I'm a little tech geek as well. Um, but I think um, wellness and the focus that we have there is going to make its way into the metaverse as well in that I can enter the metaverse anonymously with my identity verified. Right. And so now if I need to seek support and help, but I'm afraid to expose that it's me, 
that's having a hard time with something, I can do that anonymously and I can get the support of the EAP plan inside my corporation um, or access to the insurance to, to cover the costs of, of that support, but I can do it anonymously. And I think that there is a huge real world human aspect mm. that this technology can bring that makes life a little bit easier for everyone along the way. Yeah. And I think that's going to be really important as we stretch in. I think I think the wellness more broadly and I mean we talked about diversity of thought, diversity of cultures being important in creating successful products because more minds are better than fewer. But it's really interesting that that also kind of leads into wellness and how we can use technology to harness that. And we see more and more companies adopting software around supporting their staff, and they're not using it for their for their, for their project based workers. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how we can start developing support systems because ultimately, mental health and well being has been continuously proved yeah. to be an important part of efficiency and productivity. Cool. So let's go into opportunities. I I find the freelancers I spend time with are generally very good at helping me kind of understand that I'm not really describing my problem effectively. Like, let's break it down to what do you really want to get done? So taskification uh, of, of activity, um, instead of a job title that no one knows what is needed, but breaking down, getting into the work, how are you seeing the freelancer's role in educating the buyer? This is a really interesting question and problem. And, and actually, it works from, from both sides in the exact opposite way. What I mean by that is you need at least one party in an interaction to know what they're doing. <laughs> right? So That's I mean, you in this yeah, yeah. You rarely see two, no. uh, but, but you need at least one. And, and very rarely is there even one. And what I mean by that is the freelancer needs to come and say, okay, uh, I'm not selling you a logo, right? Actually, logo is a bad example because most companies kind of think they need a logo. But let, you know, talking about a, a, a change to an e-commerce website, whatever it is, the, the, the freelancer who comes and says, "Here's the opportunity it opens up for you. Here's the, the value of this proposition. Here's how I'm going to achieve it," which is the actual thing. And then here are three milestones of when we'll touch base. Here's what we'll be achieved at each milestone, and here's how we'll converse in between. Right? That's the ideal scenario. At no point have I talked about my skill as a web developer, no. <laughs> and and that. Either you have the individual coming with that perspective, or you have the company who has the savvy to go, well, we need this problem solved. These are the skills. These are the touch points. This is how we do it. So you need at least one party to do that. But what's important about it, and I think this is the really interesting point about the future of work as a whole, is titles are not valuable. <laughs> and, and when you look at startup culture, and we talked about this earlier, the cross-functional team, I very much clean my own office quite regularly. Like mm -hmm. there, there is... There is a massive importance to understanding and identifying objective-based roles rather than roles for the sake of roles. I'm not here to sit down for 10 hours a day and work. I'm here to achieve a specific set of objectives. And if I finish those objectives at three, maybe I'll stop working at three. Um, and it, it actually it, it brings to mind um, Working Styles, the book that's just just come out, which uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at soon. Um, the way that people work is as important as the work that they are doing. And I think creating this idea of task-based, objective-based uh, projects is incredibly valuable to both companies and individuals. But as I say, there is an onus on at least one party to have learned that infrastructure. Yeah, it really important element of it. That's one of the things I, I really appreciate with the work with Open Assembly, and, and, and they've been largely tied to the Laboratory for Innovation Sciences at Harvard, yeah. um, who's done quite a bit of work with NASA, the US Space Agency, and crowdsourcing was the driver there. Um, and, and so this idea of being able to define your problem and, and go through the effort and study and research how to effectively define a problem creates so much opportunity because it is simple if you're going to say, okay, get me a logo, get me a brand identity for my right. organization that's going to energize and engage my team. Okay, good. So we can do that. Okay, now I need to figure out how to deal with sunspots coming in uh, for the space station. Right. Okay, completely different thing. And I may need hundreds of minds, thousands of minds working on that kind of a problem. But the better I can articulate that, the more effectively it can actually be accomplished along the way. So I think for, for many organizations, that, that first step is how do I do it so that I can engage an individual to accomplish a task? Yeah. But then it, it opens up so many opportunities to start saying, oh, wait a minute, I can tap into the minds of the world. Right. You know, it's, I, I think NASA, and I, I apologize if I get my numbers off, but 
roughly 17,000 employees, 50,000 contract workers, but they have documented ideas from over a million people yeah. who are bringing their thoughts and ideas because of the passion element that we get. And that's so common in the freelancer. I'm opting into this project. I think this is neat. It's a problem that I want to solve. I want to participate in. I want to test my skills and see, can I come up with something here and find that, oh, wait a minute, the skill set that I've developed is applicable so many other areas that I didn't realize it could be used. Well, a a really fun exercise we get individuals to do. So so when one of the first parts of the accelerator program uh, that we developed is this framework of how to develop a proposition. Now, a proposition is ultimately an articulation of a problem you can solve. So we ask them to answer five questions. What do you do? Hopefully everybody gets that one right. I am a designer. I am a developer. I am an engineer, whatever it is. What problem do you solve? And that's a list of what types of problems can the skill that I have potentially solve? then who can you solve those problems for? And you start to group those problems into specific company narratives and clients that might have those problems that you could solve particularly well. How do you solve it? Start to sew the bits together. Okay, well, I use this skill set to solve this problem for this person in this way. And then finally, why are you the right person to solve it? What is your relevant experience and relevant interest that makes you not only the right person in terms of your skills, but the right person in terms of the fit for the projects and how you work? I, I love it. And and the fun part of this to me, and it, it, I also get very excited by the number of people who are doing side hustles with it. If you're running a large department for an organization, those are the same competencies oh, that you need to have. Completely. And so engaging people who have had to do that and broken out of the mold of I'm in a role and a job title, and that's my definition, so valuable for the individuals who want to change and transform their own individual organization if you're part of a large company. Right. And I think that's one of the things that that we need to help people get over is you can advocate for freelancers without saying that's the only way people are ever going to work. There are going to be plenty of people who want to be an employee of a large organization. I have no problem with that. That's fine. Uh, There are going to be plenty of people who want to do work physically on site in a certain location. There are going to be people who want to start their own business and build it into a giant business. Fine. But let's adopt and engage this population that wants to work in a freelance capacity. I also think that right now we're very good at describing different types of businesses in different ways and different types of workers in different ways. And the more I spend time in this space and the more people I interact with, the more I come across the fact that actually the the key characteristics, the key principles upon which a massive business is built and a single person operation is built are very, very similar. And actually, it's just this kind of slider of flexibility in terms of we need to set objectives, we need to understand the problems that we're solving, and we need to create the right infrastructure to solve those problems. Sometimes those problems are small and need a small number of people. Sometimes those problems are big and need a big number of people. Mm -hmm. And I think the less you approach it as like us and them and more of like, we're all in the business of solving problems and we need to work out the right infrastructure around that. Yeah, and, and just the freedom to have the conversation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so if you go through that, why is it so hard for organizations to try to, to just break the mold from, well, this is the way that we've always done things. Well, what is it? We know structurally that there's almost a corporate immune system, if you will, that, that says, no, 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 you have to do it according to the the, the the process that we set up. But why do people resist there's a, doing things a different way? There's a real problem of confidence, I think, individual confidence. You know, even, even managers within large businesses who are very successful and they're, they're doing very well at their job and they're achieving their KPIs or whatever it is, there is a there is a confidence required to have a more relaxed interaction with someone and there is an entrepreneurial whenever we talk about entrepreneurs or the entrepreneurial mindset what we're talking about is problem solvers who go out and do it and actually i think we massively uh, we, we use this grandiose terminology and we make it sound amazing and that's also what really good janitors do yeah. it's also what anyone who's doing well at their job does that process of problem solving and i think that when we look at individuals entering the freelance world Almost none of them, in fact, I would go as far as to say not a single person when they start, thinks of themselves as this problem-solving business. And in the same way, businesses just don't view work and workers in that way either. And there is very little ownership within enterprise of the bigger business objectives. And because of that lack of ownership, there is a lack of confidence in being savvy in problem-solving. And there is also a rigidity in the way that people work. So I, I'm perhaps, you're probably a better person to answer this question than I am, but from what I've seen is 
the way that individuals, whether whether they're in an organization or or independent, the way they think and approach problem solving, or rather they don't think and approach problem solving, they think and approach what they're doing within a certain piece of infrastructure. And from education, from a very early stage, we are always playing a role within something and therefore we stick to our lane and hiring freelancers and being flexible is not sticking to the lane that we're used to. Yeah, we're coloring outside the lines, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, um, there's an early trainer in my career who asked a very simple question um, and, and it's always stuck with me. He just said, when is the last time you did something for the first time? Yeah. And there's a level of, of uncomfortableness Anytime you're doing something unique, different, that you haven't been there before, you're going to an event that you haven't been to. And I think that's one of the, the blessings of having the opportunity to be a freelancer is to step into something, to experience that little bit of discomfort, mm -hmm. but also to have the empathy to understand that the person on the other side of the table hasn't. And maybe they're more uncomfortable than you are oh, I, I, and in the situation. And if you can help coach them through that moment, I think that there's so much of a learning opportunity that, that the individual has had the courage to be that freelancer, to step outside of the normal lane, if you will, mm -hmm. is, is creating an opportunity for others to start seeing adoption paths. There's a really interesting, um, uh, so someone, someone told me something that I've, I've always kept with me very strongly, which is that. The, the the person asking the most questions in the room is in control of the room. Mm -hmm. Like it's rarely the person answering the question. If you think about going into a job interview, you're the person who has to answer all the questions, they're in charge. When you come in as a freelancer and you ask them questions that are all designed to go, let's get to the point where you're comfortable, you're much more likely to be successful in that interaction because you're in control of it and they get to relax and feel comfortable. And I think what you're what you're saying is exactly right. The vast majority of people haven't painted outside of the lines yet. And so the moment you come with this opportunity, if you also don't come with the with the confidence of facilitating their comfort, then it's very difficult for them to interact. I, th I think you're hitting a beautiful point and one that I would encourage everyone in the audience to think about as they're interacting with those organizations that they're trying to generate business from is, are, are you finding yourself in a position where you're just telling? Or are you finding yourself in a position where you're asking questions? Mm -hmm. And I think you will absolutely recognize the more often you're the one asking the questions, that the more likely you get to an outcome that right. everyone is happy with, not just you, yeah. but the client is very happy with what they're getting because you've uncovered the right things. I think too many people I, I encounter are feeling like they're having to tell people what to do versus pausing to, to reframe it and say, okay, clearly there's there's a, a missing understanding. How do I ask the questions? How do I face amateur psychiatrists, if you will, yeah. to get them to answer their own question about what's well, truly needed? Winning an argument is not about disagreeing with somebody. It's about showing them how you actually both agree <laughs> on something, right? <laughs> and and I think that it's the same applies for the work yes. freelancer. You don't go in with this, 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 pugnacity of here's what we do here's how it works here's what i'm going to achieve for you go in and go what would you like to achieve you know what are the things that you're worried about how can we work through them here is what i've seen this works in the past and i think the more it requires a certain level of confidence to have that level of collaboration because you have to feel comfortable answering questions but that's also a case for comfortable saying i don't know the answer or we'll have to work on that but i think to go back to your original question about what are people scared of it really does fall into this idea of it's outside of the lines, the remit within which they have been set and been working for a while. And unless somebody comes with those questions and comfort and confidence, it's very difficult to surmount that hurdle. It seems risky, even if it might actually be significantly less risky. So let's talk about another opportunity, maybe shifting direction a little bit. Uh, freelancers have, for years, kind of existed and they've done it independently and they've done it within their community. Now these digital tools have opened up. So we've got platforms that are emerging all over the place, trying to create community, trying to embrace people in, offering training to people, offering banking services. What, what kind of resources do you see being made available to the freelance community that just wow you and say, you know, boy, I wish this was around when I was first thinking about being a freelancer? Well, not to blow our own horn too much, but that was kind of the ethos upon which Unpin was set that was, up. That was there was a softball, but I want more. All of our, all, all of our, all of our, uh, all of our team were freelancers, and and our whole mentality around approaching this this part of the economy was 
what did we want when we graduated university or we left school and we left our jobs? And I think the things that I've been most excited about, underpin and otherwise, is this consolidation, aggregation of business tools around how you build and develop your, your business persona, your marketing, your client outreach, your lead generation, your marketplace pitching, your, your accounting, your compliance, all of these things into simple systems. And what we saw in the late kind of 90s, early noughties was this surge of SaaS products for SMEs. So this sudden surge of the number of number of companies providing amazing services to SMEs by vertical, by their departments. And now what we're seeing is this aggregation of, of horizontal services that provide this full workflow management to freelancers. So things I'm most excited about are open banking payment opportunities, massively reducing the cost to payments um, for freelancers. I mean, we've all been in, in taxis or in shops where they keep changing the car machine they're using because it's a slightly better percentage on one. You know, that is a solvable problem. We should not be taking money from every transaction of individuals. Um, two is the movement from um, transactional recruitment to service-based um, products. In other words, within a project-based economy, you don't want to be constantly churning through transactions. You want to be setting up systems where companies can have benches of talent and, and organizations they work with, and individuals can have networks of companies and clients that they work with. The most successful freelancers and the most successful clients are the ones that rely on their existing networks and have services that manage them. And I think those areas around payment and, and, and network development rather than transactional relationships is what's really important. Um, in an ideal world, and we're, we're working on some machine learning tools to try and do this, you want to be able to step into freelancing or step into hiring in an open talent or, 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 or moving into an open talent system. And you want to immediately be connected with a group of people that might be compatible with you and start to have interesting conversations and develop relationships. So I think the payment side, I mean, there's loads of cool stuff happening in tax. It's very hard to get very excited about it, <laughs> but it's very important. There is a population that gets very excited yeah. about that. Don't underestimate that. Tap into them. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I'm a big lover of spreadsheets. But uh -huh. I remember like every time I start talking about it, I was telling my wife a spreadsheet joke and she just stared at me blankly and I was like, that's completely fair. Yeah. <laughs> That's completely... <laughs> yeah, we can get there. It's... What, what, what about you? What is the? Is it? Is it technology? Is it? Is it the consulting? Is it the services? Is it what is it that you think is? I, 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 I'm, I find that some of the transactions, some of the administrative activities that can go away, the concept of smart contracts that can kind of yeah. streamline things and allow me to do the work I want to do. Um, yeah, I think of teachers. If you talk to them. The ones who are leaving the profession, it's because they don't get to teach anymore. Right. They have all this administration. Doctors and nurses, same thing. Oh, all this documentation I need to do, all these legal regulatory boundaries. And so and taxi is uh, all, yeah, <laughs> all of those things, what's freeing me up to do the work I enjoy doing that caused right. me to come into this field, that caused me to learn, that generated passion, that made me excited about coming to work every day. And when you start seeing that some of that stuff strip away, and I can trust that it's being done over here. So the transparency of things is the other part that fascinates me with the technology. Uh, because if I just go to the, this simple part of an interview. You know, back to, to my passion in this field, it's because I believe that the process of connecting people with work is broken. Why do we interview people today? At, at its most fundamental level, I don't trust. I, you know, here's what I need to accomplish. You told me you can accomplish it, but now I need to ask you 30 questions. I need to have someone go do a background check. I need to do references. I need to check that you went to university. I need, I need to take about two weeks of time to go through a process to learn to accept that you're honest with me. Right. And I think that's where we have the fundamental flaw and we can start breaking that down. You talked about networks earlier. And when someone says, hey, John, work with Albert, trust him. Right. But someone I know, done, we move right through it. How do we get to a better piece of that? I think, I think that there's another really important point you're picking on, which is around um, a work first format of hiring. And I agree. I now really don't want to use the word hiring. Every time it comes to my mouth, <laughs> engaging. I'm, I'm engaging. Engaging. So the, 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 when we are looking at work first formats of engaging talent, rather than people first formats, traditionally, you hire somebody who's going to sit inside your institution for 20 years. 
So you have this like interaction that's much more personal, it's much more about the individual and whether you kind of get them, whether you fit with them and whether you're willing to work for them for the next 20 years. And what that creates is a real lack of diversity, a real lack of access to opportunity and a whole host of other issues. Now, with freelancing project-based work, there's this incredible opportunity to go, I don't care who you are. What I care about is, can you deliver in a way that is, the, the way is gonna add value to what I'm doing and there are other aspects around cultural fit that are important, but they're more about creating importance around the products and the company and the community. And so when we go to these, 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 I mean, text, like, you know, looking at smart contracts and, and digital, digital person, you know, digital identities and kind of like work passports, electronic work passports, we start to create this infrastructure, which, yeah, removes the onus of responsibility about, or sorry, removes the importance on how much do I like this person and more about how much can I create an interesting format of work with this person add value? And do I trust somebody's recommendation? Yes, I do. And I can see all the documentation is done because it's all digitized and simple and we can start moving through things faster. And there will be mistakes. Sometimes Absolutely. it won't be perfect. Sometimes it will be awful, but we have insurances to cover for that. We have systems that we build to try and protect ourselves against that. And we learn from it. it it it's fun. All right, so we're coming up on about five minutes left that we've got. So let's talk about just some priorities. Things that are going on in the market today, at whether it's a local scale or it's a global scale, that we need people to be aware of and engage into. You know, the people who are going to reach out to you after this event who say, Albert, I need to talk to you about how do I get involved with what are the things that they should really be focused on that are happening in the here and now? So broad, broad spectrum topic wise, the three things that I'm most interested in are education, infrastructure, policy. How do we create better systems for education to teach people how to commercialize their skills and build businesses around their craft and businesses to identify the problems they want to solve and how they might engage with open talent? Number two is infrastructure. How do we actually create the systems that facilitate these interactions while allowing individuals and businesses to focus on the fun bits? Exactly what you were describing. And three is policy and more broadly kind of political infrastructure, which is how can we create a understanding and knowledge of what is going on inside of this economy? You know, when you talk to a lot of politicians, they're not particularly aware of what's going on inside yeah. this economy. How do we create that knowledge and awareness and then turn it into practical evidence-based frameworks to reduce the barriers to facilitating project-based work, which absolutely we have the information. And in terms of specific ways that you can get involved, please do reach out, you know, go to the Association for the Future of Works website and sign up, check out Underpin if you're a freelancer. But I think what I'm really interested in now is aggregating as many people as possible to be part of this conversation and platforming it to the right people. So sign up to the Association for the Future of Work. You'll be able to join our new community platform soon um, and, and reach out to, to me directly. Yeah, and I think the standards that you've created and kind of the, the, the commitment to the freelancer um, and the language around how I engage freelancers and, and what's there has been very, very impressive to me as we go through it. Thank you. Um, I'd flip back and, and encourage everyone um, Center for the Transformation of Work or transformationofwork.org. We bring a community together on the first and the third Thursday of every month for an hour. Um, ranges from 40 people to 200 people. One of the things that I love is that we have this beautiful community of people who are just honest with each other. Mm -hmm who just talk about the, the challenges that they're experiencing, who share the research that they're working on. Uh, we had a great conversation about unpaid work, thoughts around that, getting people to, to go, and the, and the research from 10,000 freelancers, right. um, which is so important. We need the individual voice to be part of that, so I encourage that. But I also, you, know, you, you said policy, I'll take it up a level. There's a meeting coming up uh, mid-October, The 10th to the 14th, uh, the ILO, the International Labor Organization. So the trade association for all of the trade unions that exist out there. Uh, their focus, it, I, I look at it, it's, it's decent work in the platform economy. I've got a, a, a nice 72 page document that tells us all the research that they've done. And they've got this nice tri-party um, group that's coming together. So people representing businesses, people representing governments, and people representing trade unions who are going to have this active debate on what should we do about the freelance economy. Right. And the only voice that's not in the room freelancers. is the freelancer. And I think this is this is a common occurrence in, in this space. You have the institutions that we need to help change 
don't traditionally involve themselves with the people that they're trying to make changes for. And I think the same for, for government and also enterprises as well is, is the importance on hearing the voice of freelancers and the freelance economy is, is massive. And I think that, you know, if I take what Alina is doing, if I take what you're doing with the Association of Future Work, if I take what we're doing with the Center for the Transformation of Work, it is, it's about aggregating community yeah. so that we can have a voice that's out there. Because if you go out to the market, if I'm uh, a, an editor of, a, of an online publication of a, any media outlet, and I say, I want to hear the voice of the freelancer, I want to hear what is going on and the way people are engaging open talent. Where is that town square that I come to, to get the information, to aggregate things together? Yeah. And I think there's so much opportunity to be addressed there. Yeah. So I just want to thank you first for hosting me. This is, uh, for those out there, this facility is as wonderful um, as it appears on the screen. How about you are an incredible person. I, uh, your passion for bringing value into this market, for engaging people to be who they want to be. Um, and to bring value into the market is exactly what we need in the world. And uh, I thank you for the time today. Thank you. Thank you so much for being um, being here and for having this conversation. I feel like I've followed John for a while in the work of the CTW and fanboy from a distance. Um, <laughs> and then we finally got to chat and I was so excited. I basically just shouted at him for half an hour. <laughs> These are all the things that I'm excited about and doing and then slowly but surely had to wind back and work out different bits and bobs that we could actually work through. And I'm really excited to see the work of the CTW and, and, and how how that moves forward as well as uh, how we work together with the association for the future yeah. of work and we have an event this week on the 6th that john will be at and help excited present to present some of the work on standards which is really exciting and it's really really great to be a part of this event and to be able to talk on this platform to so many people about such important issues that are moving yeah. forward so quickly yeah elena um thank you uh alex thank you um back to you guys look forward to hearing more <laughs> well thank you so much john albert this was so insightful in fact, you have brought so many points that will be raised also throughout the month. We have sessions on inclusivity, on compliance, on uh, free work, and many, many more. Uh, please do check the program, book the sessions you like, and please attend. Um, I do have a small question, though, uh, something that was bothering me for, for a long time. Uh, you spoke about standardization. So the question to, to you is, how about the terminology? <laughs> freelancers are called gig workers contingency workforce whatever they're called will there be like one uh one word that would describe us all in a in a normal sense yeah i, I i'll give you where we're coming with it so um open assembly john windsor who's the founder of the organization is working on a book um through harvard business press right now um a couple workbooks have, have been brought out and we did crowdsource um language in a glossary here and open talent is where we landed um, because so many people have so many different roles and the words that we use often describe the contractual relationship mm. between the individual and the company. So I'm an employee of your organization. Well, I also have a side hustle because mm. I'm doing a project over there. I'm an adjunct professor over here. W what does that mean? And so just open talent is what we're using to describe individuals and just the environment that is not caught up on what is the contractual relationship, but what's the problem I'm trying to solve? I tend to describe myself as openly talented. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think one of the things that's important is the individ we, we can be uh, prescriptive and I think it's really important. And I think open talent is a brilliant phrase that's being used a lot, for particularly businesses to start to understand this. The other issue is, and I'm looking at this from like a digital marketing perspective, how do you then get people to get on board? And we've seen that people call themselves so many different things and we've ended up focusing much more on the culture of, and work style rather than how they specifically reference themselves as a worker. And ultimately, we need to make people just need to make more of an effort going forward in using terminology that's been prescribed to the system that works well, as well as being comfortable with the fact there is variation. But the similarity between the ways people work is the way thing that ties them together. The only other thing I'd add into it is um, don't get hung up on it. Yeah, <laughs> because if you're talking to a business that wants to engage you to solve a problem, right, and they want to call you alphabet soup, yeah, help them solve the problem. That's what's more important than what you're called on a piece of paper, at least for me. Yeah, um, as long as it's not offensive, as long as it's not uh, rude in that end, um, you know, don't don't get too caught up in that. I think just one final point, which is on the standardization of contracts, which is that. Once we, as we are both working on this, creating better systems for interaction, the, the importance of the, the word that you put in becomes far less. 
And I think, yeah, not getting hung up on the language that's used so long as it's respectful, but focusing more on, you know, how do I feel comfortable interacting? Because open talent's becoming such a big thing that there won't be anything outside of open talent. We all are open talent. Yeah. Um, and as long, as long as you're open to solving, I mean, I, one of the research pieces we did was, uh, was addressing the multiple me's. Now, how many different versions of you do you bring to the world? Right. You're solving problems for different things, whether it's in your home life, it's in a work life, it's in the neighborhood and the community that you're a part of. Why do we have to put labels and declare that you're one thing on that? It's just, it's a, it, it's an area I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, so uh, avoid labels. <laughs> This is excellent. Well, I love open talented. That's what we're going to use. <laughs> Thank you so much once again for uh, your work, for joining us and for the work of your organizations. I'm happy that freelance business community is now part of the family. And I'm looking forward uh, to contribute to the growth of freelance ecosystem in general and promote freelancing worldwide as much as we can. Um, Great month ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.